Good evening, everyone. Good evening and welcome to q and I'm Virginia Trioli and we're broadcasting live from the beautiful Drum Theatre here in Dandenong in the southeast of Melbourne. And with me to answer your questions tonight, Victorian Police Commander Stuart Bateson, Labor Shadow Justice Minister Claire O'Neill, the Minister for Citizenship and Multicultural Affairs, Alan Tudge, lawyer and local community advocate, Nidal Nayoun, and veteran crime reporter and author, Andrew Rule. Please welcome our panel. Now, as you may have noticed, I am not Tony Jones. Tony has been struck down by a virus and sends his apologies and we all wish him a speedy recovery. Q&A is live in Eastern Australia on ABC TV and live on iView and News Radio at 9.35. And you can stream us on YouTube, Facebook and Periscope. We are everywhere. Now, Greater Dandenong is a melting pot for Australian multiculturalism. Over 60% of residents here were born overseas. Our two politicians both represent nearby Melbourne electorates and our audience have some curly questions for them. So let's get straight to the first, and it comes from Jan Mogorovic. On Friday, Carlton lost by 24 points to Collingwood. <laughs> Malcolm Turnbull just lost his 30th news poll. <laughs> Who's going to have a worse 2018? <laughs> <laughs> Well, Jan, there's three possibilities in there. Collingwood, Carlton and the Prime Minister. Andrew Rule, we'll start with you. Collingwood. <laughs> <laughs> even though you beat us, even, th even though you beat Carlton. <laughs> I'll stick with that. You stick with that, OK. <laughs> Nadal. Well, that's, that's quite interesting. I, I mean, the, the, I'm, I'm a bit afraid to get into the personal politics because I don't know enough about the politics. I'm not a politician on, on this set. But I think um, the losers might actually be the Australian people because when, um, when you have these leadership debates, I think it takes focus away from some of the serious issues that we should be talking about. And I also think that it creates an environment where politicians, because they need to shore up their support, they end up you know, um, suggesting policy grounds that are not really well considered sometimes, just so that they can feel, I think, they need to back up the support. And that doesn't end up with good policies, results for the rest of the, um, for the Australian population. So I think the losers are us eventually when we, we, when we see this play out. Alan Touch, I'll, I'll come back to you. <laughs> <laughs> Stuart Bateson, I'm sure you're happy to be asked, as a mem serving member of Victoria Police, who you'd like as preferred Prime Minister. Should I ask you that? Well, there was one thing I was told, and then that was <laughs> do not get involved in the politics <laughs> of the battle tonight. So uh, I think all three men are in for a tough year. <laughs> uh, there's no doubt, and uh, I wish them all the best. <laughs> Claire O'Neill. Well, thanks for your question. I love that you had to contextualise that in football, just to make it all make sense to us living here in Melbourne. Um, look, we're here tonight in the city of Greater Dandenong. This is an extraordinary community, but it's a community that faces some really big challenges. You know, there are 16% of the young people who are living in this city right now who don't have uh, work or education. We've got families in the community who are moving backwards instead of forwards. We've got schools and hospitals in this area that are crying out for funding. We'll get to all of that tonight. Yeah, a absolutely. But the, the point is that here we are tonight talking about the news poll. Um, and we have been through five years almost of the Turnbull government now and it's been back and forth on this or that personality and this or that conflict. And I just think it's gone on for too long. There are urgent issues that are facing this community here and our country more broadly and they need the full attention of our national politicians and they're not getting it. Well, the, the Labor leadership matter went on for a fair bit of time too. So, yeah. you know, pot, kettle, yeah. black. No, I, and I, ac I, I, really, I, I, I really take that point and I, I agree with you. you know, how can it be that we, you know, the Labor Party has a lot to answer for and what it did. And I don't think they're necessarily f copying your lead, but I, no, I no, take no, your but, point. But, but I take your point, Virginia, <laughs> because we have got to stop this. This bickering that goes on in politics is just shrouding the very okay. important issues that face our country, and we can't continue like this. Alan Tudge, who's yeah. going to have the worst year? <laughs> <laughs> well, I hope North Melbourne has a great year, and I hope Malcolm <laughs> Turnbull has a great year, and he is having a good year for the Australian people. And most importantly, under his leadership, there's been 420,000 jobs created in the last 12 months alone. So as far as his year, and he's there for the Australian people, that's a damn good outcome. And, and yet, with. and yet, and yet, news poll marks him down, the people of Australia mark him down in that poll every single time. Well, it's, it's very common, actually, for governments to slip in between um, elections. 
You saw with John. Sixty years yes. on the front. Yeah. Let's, let's, let's reflect back on history. Everyone now says that John Howard is, was a great prime minister, and he was. But he was behind the polls in, in 1998, before the 2001 election, yep. and before the 2004 election. Before the 2001 election, he was at one stage behind 3961. Sure. Are you saying Malcolm Turnbull can came catch back. up? Of course he can. Okay. Of course he can. I mean, politics these days turns very, very quickly, as you know, Virginia. And when it comes closer to the election, people will very much focus on the two alternatives a very high taxing opposition, $200 billion of extra taxes they want to place onto families, um, versus a, a government which has delivered jobs growth, delivering higher wages, and really um, tackling cost Before of Before we leave this subject, though, um, because uh, this issue came up today, I should put this to you, and perhaps you as well, Claire O'Neill. Barnaby Joyce is now calling on Malcolm Turnbull to improve by Christmas, and his benchmark, I guess, for that is a better poll result in news poll, or consider giving up the leadership. He says, if you truly believe this is exactly the sentiment of the people, then you also have an obligation not to drive your party or the government off a cliff. Do you agree? I don't think it was a particularly useful contribution from Barnaby this afternoon, but um, <laughs> uh, listen, we're, we're not into setting, we're not into, we're not, we're not into setting artificial deadlines, and I'm very confident that as we get closer to the election, the Australian people will start to focus very much on the alternative, and the alternative is $200 billion of taxes. It's a tax on your home. It's a tax on your job. It's a tax on your small business. It's a tax on your investment. And most recently, they've announced a tax on your retirement savings. All right. Well, let's hear from Claire O'Neill. Um, I, I can't think of a leader who decided to voluntarily relinquish the leadership, including on the Labor side, if they thought the polls were bad. Um, so Barnaby Joyce's exhortation will fall on deaf ears, I imagine. Well, I'm not sure what Barnaby Joyce or Malcolm Turnbull would make of this. I'd, I'd just make the point again that we've got big issues facing the country and all we see when we look to Canberra is politicians talking about themselves. And I do not believe that the government is going to recover its position until it stops focusing on the issues that it faces internally and looks outward to the Australian people. OK. Well, let's move on. Our next question now comes from Maria Serra. Thank you, Virginia. Um, yet again, we've seen shocking footage of animals on live export ships. Um, dozens of investigations have exposed extreme cruelty, sheep baking in their own skin, gasping for oxygen, smothered in faeces, unable to lie down or rest. This isn't just cruel, it's illegal. When will the government uphold its own laws and end the cruel live sheep trade? It's a good question. I mean, and, and we've seen these images before. It's not the first time. But, uh, Alan Tudges, there seems to be a sense now, notwithstanding the fact that our live export trade is worth a great deal of money to a great number of producers, that maybe this kind of ex uh, exporting has to come to an end. Oh, certainly the footage, which I've only seen a part of it, was, was devastating footage and completely unacceptable. I mean, we shouldn't have cruelty to animals at all. And uh, we have got, though, as, as a nation, the best track record in the world as far as animal welfare goes. We've got the best standards in the world as far as animal welfare goes. Do you mind if I jump in there? Because sure. I spoke to the RSPCA this morning, and when I, I put to them that this surely can't be an isolated incident, given how much we export and how many ships leave on a daily basis, uh, and, and in their considered view, they believe it's not. That we may have the footage this time, but it's not that uncommon. Well, there's an investigation which is going to occur, which the Agricultural Minister has already announced, um, into this particular episode. Now, unfortunately, there have been past episodes which we are aware of, but we have incredibly strict standards, and by and large, those standards are adhered to. Now, in the process, what that means is thousands of jobs for Australians and providing food supplies uh, for the countries who desperately need those foods. So is your, is your answer then, no, it's not time to end well, the trade? Well, no, it's not time to end the trade, and what we're not going to do is just off the back of a single media report, close down the trade as occurred under the former Labor government. I'm going to come to you, Andrew Rule. Surely it's time to clean it up. Um, I, I come from the land originally and uh, was brought up understanding the reality of, of uh, husbandry of sheep and cattle. It's not pretty when you see uh, stock slaughtered. It never is. But this is different again. This is They're starving or they're, or they're, they're uh, expiring from heat. 
Uh, surely we just need really tough regulations that are uniform across the board. And, and there are tough regulations. But the question went to that. In terms of the, 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 the enforcement of them. Yeah, yeah well, that's that Maria's announced. question went to that, which was just simply upholding yeah. the regulations that exist uh, at the moment. A, a, absolutely. And, and also what the, uh, the Minister for Agriculture announced today was a, a, a whistleblower hotline, if you like, um, so that a whistleblower can inform the government of a potential practice which is not adhering to the law. I think that's a good start. We can potentially use use more technology um, in, in relation to, you know, webcams and things like that which are on these ships which might provide additional security right. as well Scrutiny. for those animals. Claire Nell? Well, I think Andrew's right. I think it is time that we worked to clean up this industry and the point you make is a really good one. You know, that footage was just truly gut-wrenching and it's unbelievable that anyone could stand back and see animals treated that way. Um, this industry has got a bit of a way to go, I think, to prove to us that it can continue um, without um, abusing animals in the way that we've seen so frequently do. Um, I don't want to get into an argy-bargy between Labor and Liberal. There are a range of things that Labor believes need to be done differently about this. But I was really interested to see in the media reports, you know, as, a as Andrew mentioned, you know, it's farmers who are so upset by this because the um, care and attention that they pay to their livestock to see livestock and animals treated yeah. that way is, is horrendous for them also. Let's move on to my next question now, and it comes from Peter Hudson. Good, sorry about that. Good evening. <laughs> In my youth, I had respect for policemen and would do, and we would do it as we were told. The attitude today, enhanced by the pendulum going too far and sparing the rod, is you can't touch me. Our police must be frustrated and also possibly scared by what they might face when called out. No wonder they react the way they do, as often portrayed by a biased press who want to sensationalise in order to sell their story. What can we do to fix these related discipline and respect problems in our community? Stuart Bateson, we'll start with you. Yeah, I guess it is a really tough job. I mean, um, when I started 30 years ago, I think it was a little bit easier for, for frontline police. And, and I look at our people um, today and, you know, if you put yourself in their position, they're, they're starting their every working day by putting on a bulletproof vest. Um, and, and it might be the day that they need it. Um, so no doubt um, policing can be dangerous. And, and every policeman out there would be able to tell you a story about being abused or spat at uh, or, or indeed insult, assaulted. So it is a tough job. Um, but you know, on the other side of that, we still really enjoy great relationships with the community. And, um, you know, there is incidents that um, we do feel a lack of respect, but we also feel um, that we have a good connection with the community uh, and that we represent those views well. So from, from my point of view, I think it's always going to be a challenge, and, but we pride ourselves on being a police force that, that has that good connection with their community and it's something that we'll strive to continue uh, to, to progress. Um, there will be challenges along the yeah. way, but you know, we, we, we still have that respect, we feel. Stuart, g going to, to Peter's question, is there an element here, he referenced the old adage of, you know, um, spare the rod and spoil the child. Is, um, that seems to be, you know, Peter's reflection on this issue. Is there something uh, in that for you? I, I think um, the Chief Commissioner often talks um, to us about confident humility, uh, and that's about having the confidence to take um, control of a situation, but also the humility to actually treat people with decency and with human, um, you know, respect to their human rights. And, and I think that's the challenge for us. We've got to, we've got to be able to um, take control, but also maintain our respect and our respect for people's dignity. And, and that's, a, that's something that we will always progress towards. Uh, Nadal Nayuna, I'll come to you, because the question goes to um, discipline and respect. Do you feel that, as Stuart's reflected, some of that has sort of, f sort of fallen away over recent years? Look, I, th I think police do a tough job, and I think most people in the society accept that police, um, you know, um, do a tough job, and they do it to protect all of us. Um, but I think um, we live in a democratic society, in a society of rules and laws, and um, as much as um, there should be respect for the police, the police, sh um, uh, particularly in the hindsight of some of the footages that came out in the last week of police brutality, um, there is also an expectation for good policing and for good relationship between police and the communities that they are able to uphold 
uphold the law. And, um, and I think that, um, um, that uh, as much as um, some people were very shocked by those footages, um, I think that people from migrant communities, people who um, in, in minorities communities, generally people of indigenous background, we have a very different relationship with, with, with police. Um, for the African community, for example, the Kensington and, uh, and um, Flemington and Kensington community legal center have been documenting issues going on between the police since 1993. Um, and these stories of brutality are not new to us. I know of many personal stories of people that have been brutalized or allegedly brutalized by the police. Um, there is still a great deal of trust for the police. Um, I think there was a survey done by Monash University which indicated that 80% of the population um, have a lot of trust in the police and I think that also reflect respect for the police. Um, but you know, notably for people from South Sudanese background, that is as low as 26%. Mm. Um, and so I think there's still room for everybody, the police and the community, um, to create that kind of environment where all of us feel, feel safe enough and police don't feel as if um, the, the manner in which they put their life on the line sometimes for us is not appreciated enough. Andrew, you've reported on this issue for a very long time and, um, and on both Thanks sides. Thanks for reminding me. <laughs> <laughs> I, I There's no way of avoiding it. Routinely <laughs> introduced as a veteran. <laughs> <laughs> take, take it on the chin and with pride. Um, how, how do you respond to, to Peter's question? Uh, Peter had a bit of a shot at the media. I'm not sure that it was a shot at my branch of the media or not, but let's um, assume it was. Uh, let's assume it was. <laughs> okay, Peter, this is this is not personal, Peter, but um, it wasn't the media that pulled out a mobile phone to to photograph a mentally ill man who'd uh, been beaten and uh, humiliated, and then hosed down three times so they could take more pictures. That wasn't the media. That was a very ill-advised young policeman. Um, and I think the lesson for all police and everybody is that once the handcuffs are on, uh, perhaps the beating can stop. Uh, what happens up to the point where the handcuffs go on is another thing. Uh, I think probably most people think it's defensible for police to be very vigorous and robust when they're arresting violent people. But once they're arrested and safely contained, they shouldn't be hurt and they shouldn't be humiliated because it's a bad look when someone takes your photograph. Uh, yeah, quickly, Peter, just a comment. In my edited question, a little bit got left out, which was in relation to schooling, and it's great to see these kids here. Discipline and respect start way back before all this, and I'm definitely not having a go at the police. I'm suggesting that our community is lacking its moral compass to know when to respect the police, when okay. to do the right thing at school. All right, well, let me get um, some of the panel members to, to reflect on that. Claire O'Neill, I mean, you, you were actually mayor for a brief time of this area, and, yeah. and we've, all, we've all been to school, and we've all had varying degrees of, um, of discipline imposed on us. What's your reflection on this? I'm not sure if I agree that the conduct and behaviour of young people is so fundamentally changed in the way that you describe it, but I, I probably haven't lived for enough generations to really look back with a, a great fact base there. Um, I guess I spend a lot of my time with law enforcement in my capacity as a Shadow Justice Minister, and I think there are issues with, with some young people. I talk to police and um, they say to me that they can see um, from a really young age kids who are going to end up being a big problem. Um, so I guess that's, that's relevant. But one of the things that police also talk to me about is the, the way through some of these problems is really tight, close engagement with the communities that are most affected. And the way that we talk about these problems affects the police's ability to do that. Um, so for example, we've had um, some federal politicians come in and engage in the, um, the issue around African young people here in the southeastern suburbs of Melbourne. Um, including Peter Dutton telling us that we were all too afraid to go out to dinner, um, which I thought was just ridiculous. Um, you know, that, that sort of commentary, describing, you know, Melbourne as a lawless place, that sort of thing coming from politicians who I think should know better is, is really um, creating a big issue because it means those communities that we need to build up great trust with, we just struggle to do that. And we'll, we're coming to that issue later on this mm -hmm. evening as well. Look, at this point, let me bring in um, Shima Mohammed, who has a question which goes to the area we're discussing. Hi, Shima. 
Stuart Bateson, I am a 16 year old Sydney Australian. From what I have seen, it seems that there is a direct effort in the senior levels of Victoria Policing to engage with and learn more about my culture to increase social and cultural inclusion. But I am concerned that the importance of this effort is not as valued in junior officers. What is Victoria Police doing to make sure that the attitude recognised by its highest ranking members is also present in the police on the ground who interact with community members every day? Yeah, and that's really important. You know, I, I always say when we talk about these issues that if you actually sit down uh, and you take the time, break bread with someone or, or sit down and, and take the time to understand their story, to understand their experience, then it's very hard to hold up um, any misconceptions. Um, that's hard for frontline officers because they are so busily engaged in the day-to-day -day work of, of, of policing. So this is why it's so important that we do create um, those opportunities for our members to come together with, with new and emergency communities in time so they can understand each other. It's also really important why we need a more diverse police force. Uh, and where I've spoken about before, we need um, to have a police force that is representative of the community we serve. So we actually have people from, uh, from communities, new and emerging communities, coming and working for us. Uh, and by very the fact that they're employed and they're sitting next to our young police, that understanding starts to get built. Uh, and, and that's important. Um, so we're looking for opportunities. We certainly have community encounters that we run with uh, at the academy. Uh, and we have a whole lot of engagement and social cohesion activities that we do at a local level. But it's really important that those, those activities happen because you know, a lot of our young members haven't had uh, a lot of experience with some communities. Uh, and that's what we need to build. So it's a, it's a challenge for us, but it's something that we're really working hard towards. Um, Stuart Bateson, I know this has been your life work. Uh, it's a really important part of what you do, that community engagement and the like. Talk to us about why it's been difficult for Victoria Police to recruit a diverse group of, um, of officers. Oh, look, I think uh, one of the challenges for us is that um, we've got to become uh, an employer of choice uh, for these communities. And it's Nidal's point, you know, the, if the relationship, if there's not great trust and confidence uh, for us, uh, then they don't necessarily see that they want to work for us. Well, and actually, we're getting some comments on Twitter suggesting the problem is police policing themselves, and a strong suggestion being that there needs to be an independent review of policing and an independent oversight. Well, we do have that. We have IBAC, who provides an oversight body, and, and, and you know, from my point of view, that's a really good framework. We do not want to outsource our own integrity. Um, so we want to make sure that we're investigating, and we have done successfully. Interestingly enough, um, since 2010, which is the same time period for the six in, uh, incidents invested, uh, by, investigated by the age uh, in recent weeks, 210 police uh, have left the police force uh, while under investigation. 26 have been sacked. So we do have an accountability framework that works. Is it perfect? No. Uh, and we need to continue to keep developing it so that the public has some uh, greater trust and confidence. And part of that is making sure that we um, are more transparent, yeah. more accountable, and work with uh, community advocacy groups a lot more effectively. Yadol, what do you make of Shima's question? Um, could I answer, um, sure, sure. to um, his question about Stuart, outsourcing? Yeah. Stuart's question about outsourcing integrity. Um, I think the, poli the Victorian police particularly have done some great work, particularly since the Hale Michael case. I think they've worked internally to try and address some of the issues that has caused significant issues between the Victorian police and some African communities. And as a person from the African communities, I'm very grateful for that because I want to feel confident in the Victorian police force because I live in Victoria. Mm. Um, but I do believe that I, I don't think that um, police investig investigating police um, really strike a lot of confidence, particularly when we've just had you know, a high-ranking member of the police force um, being publicly reported to have said some very racist things, including encouraging violence against African communities. This was someone who was responsible for the complaints that were coming through. Um, and uh, at the same time, uh, one of the police men who was involved in the Hale Michael case and had a number of allegations made against them was also referred to this same body. So that doesn't really encourage a lot of, of trust. I, I, you know, police, as much as we put a lot of responsibility on them, are just human beings like us. And when we put them in a position of conflict where they have to investigate each other, they have to engage people they work with on day-to-day -day basis, I don't think the results will necessarily be at least 
perceptive to other people perceiving it, you, you know, um, balance. And I do think there's an argument um, that there needs to be an independent body. I'll get a brief response from you, Stuart. We'll hear from the other panellists as well. I just think that really speaks to our challenge. You know, we, we, we can see that we need to um, increase the confidence in that system. We believe in it. We think um, the framework is right. Some of the practices uh, need improvement, and, and that's clearly evident in the last couple of weeks. Um, but in terms of the framework, we think it's a good framework. IBAC um, have that oversight yeah. ability and do that well. Um, but we've got some work to do to make sure community members like Nardole uh, have confidence in that system, and, and, and that's a, a challenge we embrace. Andrew Rule, what's your thoughts on this? I mean, what we know about uh, organisations that review themselves, we know about organisations that actually look a little differently when they're reviewed externally. Uh, where do um, you lie in this Stuart one? Stuart makes a good point about the numbers, 200. Um, I think John Sylvester made that point the other day, the same numbers. Um, However, it's always been tricky having internal um, investigators investigating people they know. This would apply not just in the police force, it would apply in any um, workplace culture where yeah. you know each other. And, um, but it's, it's particularly potent when it's the police force because they do have uh, the power of arrest over others and the power to hurt others. So uh, it is a problem and I think it does need some sort of outside um, supervision and just what that is, I'm not sure. If, if I could just make that quick point, I mean, we're an organisation of 19,000 people now, so yep. we don't all know each other. No. Um, you know, IBAC's, uh, uh, IBAC's conclusion recently that we haven't got our conflict of interest policy right um, is true uh, and that's something that we're going to work to rectify. Um, but the fact is we're a huge organisation uh, and we can create that independence and, and um, start to deal with that conflict of interest that has been so worrisome for, for the community. Shima, is what, what you've heard so far in relation to your question about what can be done to, to, to change the attitude of the police who interact with people on the ground every day, is what you've heard from Stuart, is it, is it reassuring or did you want to hear something else? Uh, I just want to hear the achievements made so far so that show that have been shown through junior police officers because yep. from my experience it doesn't seem like junior police officers that I've interacted with have that cultural understanding. So they haven't, that message hasn't got through to them yet. Let's hear from um, Alan Tudge. Uh, <coughs> broadly, I have immense respect for the Victorian Police Force and indeed the security agencies across Australia and uh, they often put themselves on the front line in harm's way and um, as Stuart was saying every morning there, if they're out in the front line, they're actually putting on a bulletproof vest. We don't do that when we go to work. Um, so I take my hat off to the police force. Um, inevitably, there's going to be some bad eggs there, as there are in any organisation, but it's particularly important to weed them out in the Victorian police or any other police force, and I'm glad to hear at least some progress is being made there. The, qu the question particularly goes to cultural understanding um, of, of officers working on the ground. From what I understand, that there's been some very good work in that regard. That, um, and I think you do get better outcomes if the police force have good relationships with the community leaders on the ground, just as the political leaders uh, make better policy if you've got better uh, engagement with those community leaders on the ground as well. I would say, though, that um, going back to some of the initial conversation that we had earlier, the, uh, the issue about respect of young people for the police officers, I think, is a real one. Um, certainly a couple of decades ago when I was younger, uh, you had immense respect for a police officer. If you saw a police officer in the street, you stood up straight and you made sure you did the right thing and you just don't see that as much anymore. And in fact, young people I know feel as if they can get away um, with, with being very disrespectful to police officers and I'd like to see that changed. I'd like to see the police empowered again to be able to um, command that respect as much as build that respect. Claire O'Neill, let's hear from you. Then we have a question from the floor that I'd like to go to. Or a comment, I'm sorry. I'm just, I'm just suspicious. I mean, people our age have been complaining about young people and how terrible they are for time immemorial. They, they really have for thousands of years. So yeah, but it's also... Yeah. I, but, it's just, but, it's but just you not also hear from the police officers, and you might, you might not hear this from Stuart, but you would have heard from police officers on the ground as well who say that they have young people and know exactly what the rules are. 
and they'll go s straight up to the line in relation to the police officers and not treat them with the respect which they deserve. Okay. Well, I think it's interesting that we're having that conversation, but at the same time a conversation about police who are using too much force. So there's, there's a difficult balance that has to be struck here, and I don't envy you in the work that you do, Stuart, because it's, it's obviously really challenging. I just make the point, as, as Alan has, you know, for every horrible thing that's happening right now in our city, the police are right there in the middle of it, and they go through really, really difficult things every day. Assault, they get sworn at, they get spat on. And it is inevitable that sometimes police aren't the best, their best selves on the job every day. Uh, and I say that not to trivialise the matters, but only to put into context. You know, Victoria Police have, I think, 14,000 interactions with Victorians every day. And here we have uh, an investigation which shows what appear to be um, uses of excessive force, and I don't hide from that, but put in context, it's not a large number. Um, there's a really interesting conversation here about how police should be regulated, and there's a lot of international evidence on this question about whether police are capable of regulating themselves. And what it tells us is that if the incidents that are happening are aberrant to the organisation's culture, so if they sit outside of what the ordinary police officer would think is normal, then police are really good at investigating themselves. But if it's the culture of the organisation itself that's the problem, then that's the time where we start yeah. to look outside. Uh, we have some students this evening from Our Lady of Sion and a comment out here in the second row. Hi. Yes, thanks. Um, hi there. So there's been a bit of talk about young people without actually talking to young people. And I don't really want to get into an... Av <laughs> as, as a 16-year-old, Shima might disagree, but go on. I'm oh, sorry, I <laughs> yes. wasn't talking about you. Very much respect you. Um, and yeah, we're not here to talk about avocado toast, but you're talking to people who aren't yet 18. We aren't 18. And yet we've been raised on videos of police brutality, not just in Australia, but in other countries. And we know the laws, and of course we respect the police. We understand that you do such a hard job. But it's a very different, it's not even a generational question, but when you're talking to young people who are in inebriated states or different states, to trust the people that they have seen brutalise people, that's a very difficult thing. So then okay. ex uh, absolutely just expect trust from. It's a very difficult thing. Thanks for that. Thanks for that comment. Um, we've got a... <laughs> Thanks so much. Now remember, if you hear any doubtful claims on Q&A, you can let us know on Twitter, and then keep an eye on the RMIT ABC Fact Check and the Conversation websites for the results. We have another question now, and it comes from Patrick Stevenson. Um, okay, so my question's for Alan Tudge, but I guess also Claire as the other politician on the panel. Um, as you mentioned, Claire, um, Peter Dutton recently claimed that people are too scared to go to restaurants here in Melbourne, um, particularly in the southeast. Um, because of violence and crime perpetrated by what he calls African gangs. Um, as someone that's lived and studied in this area for a number of years, I know that I've never been too scared to go out uh, and grab a bite. Um, and I think that demonising um, uh, minority groups in the media, like Peter Dutton has, um, is likely to be counterproductive uh, and uh, make uh, migrant uh, communities and, and people of colour uh, living in Australia feel uh, alienated and more marginalised. Um, and uh, don't you agree that, um, as I do, that um, the government has a moral duty uh, to make uh, migrant and minority communities in Australia feel welcome and feel integrated, uh, rather than fueling uh, division and racial tension? Thanks, Patrick. We'll, we'll come to um, everyone on the panel in a second, but I just thought, why don't we try this? Um, it was a, a remarkable comment that was made by Peter Dutton about people in Melbourne and South East being afraid to go out at night uh, to restaurants. Let's have a show of hands. If you were around about the time of that comment, if you were afraid to go out at night to a restaurant, whack your hand up. Anybody at all? Yeah. One up the back. Okay, thank you, sir. Thanks for saying that. All right, well, that's, that's the sense in the room. Um, Claire O'Neill, we'll come to you first. Um, well, I think, I, I mean, I fundamentally endorse everything that you said. I thought those comments were enormously irresponsible because, um, you know, we live in this extraordinary place in Melbourne. The city of Greater Dandenong is one of the most multicultural places in the world. It didn't become a harmonious and brilliant place by accident. It's actually community leaders and people around this city who are kind and decent to their neighbours, and that's how multiculturalism in the city works. <laughs> And I just find it, frankly, um, 
very distressing to hear politicians just wantonly throw out these comments when they don't think about the consequences that have for the people that live in this city. Um, and, yeah, I mean, the idea that people are afraid to go out to dinner. I actually drove down Thomas Street, Dandenong, before I arrived here. Peter Dutton, come to Thomas Street for dinner. Mm -hmm. You will see hundreds of people on the street out there. They're having a wonderful time, and they're not too afraid to go out. And clearly, these comments have got a political end. They were of no public policy value, and I just think we need to be a bit more responsible in what we say. Before we come to Alan Tudge, I'd like to go to Andrew Rule, because, I mean, you, you have had experience of reporting um, crime issues, you know, from a number of perspectives. Do you have a different take on this? Uh, I think Peter Dutton was ill-advised in using that sort of hyperbole. However, I can see why people do use that sort of hyperbole. What I thought was also ill-advised was the judge, who shall remain nameless, who tweeted from a restaurant in Mansfield, you know, basically the snow capital of Victoria, where um, wealthy middle-class judges with uh, <laughs> vintage Porsches that they race on weekends... <laughs> drive up there and drink $200 <laughs> bottles of Pinot Noir and then after having consumed a couple, I uh, hope he didn't drive home, um, tweet out something silly like, um, there, are, you know, there are citizens out to dinner in Mansfield. Well, there are, but that really misses the point. It's the citizens of some other places who, with due respect to everybody, uh, were feeling the pinch a bit because there were carjackings, there were home invasions, there were serious things that did for a while, 18 months ago, a year ago, become the subject of conversation everywhere I went. And for good reason, because it was happening. Mm. And everybody knew somebody that had had a brush with it, yeah. including me. Yeah, doll. Oh, you, you, you were carjacked, I think. I, well, I, no, I, 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 an attempt, an attempt, which was brushed off by the police. Well, and yeah. so it's not on the records. It's not in the stats. <laughs> when you say brushed off, well, what do you mean? You went to complain and they I said... I complained twice. You're, and a, you're I wrote a tough a, guy, you can handle yourself. I wrote a long um, email to somebody and then the Chief Commissioner said I hadn't laid a complaint and hadn't said a word. So there you go. <laughs> Yadol, I can see you're itching to say something. Yes, I am. Um, <laughs> 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 uh, absolutely. Um, thank you so much for, for, I mean, for that comprehensive response. And I thought, oh, my God, he's answered my question for me. But yeah. I, I noticed that there were some people who raised their hand. And I don't want to dismiss the fact that there have been people who have been victim of, of, of crime. And that that's traumatic. You know, if you've got someone invading your home, a safe space, that's a traumatic thing. And... Um, on top of those people, um, there are many more people that are just afraid, whether their home has been invaded or not, that the same thing would happen to them. Now, I don't think majority of those people are racist. I don't think majority of those people are extremists. I think they're just afraid. And I understand why they would be afraid. I mean, if you've watched the television for the last few months, you've had pictures of black African young people splash across your screen over and over again. You've been told that we are in the midst of a crisis, that you know, we can't go to restaurants. And that fear that is generated by that kind of reporting, that, which is completely you know, the opposite of the facts on the ground, uh, makes people afraid. Unfortunately, I think for the victims of crime and for the African community, that kind of fear mongering really is not a solution though. You know, we can be angry, but our anger cannot become a legislation. We have to somehow find much more sound basis um, as a community for dealing with, with, with crimes. Now, the facts are that in Victoria, that crime has actually gone down, that in Victoria is the second most safest state to be after Canberra, which I think is relatively boring. <laughs> <laughs> but, but, and, there, and there go the Canberra. <laughs> Thank you very much, Heather. <laughs> but but I, I, I do think though that what some people don't understand is that for the majority of African people, this has been a really tough time. It's been a time where we've questioned whether we can be safe in going to shopping centre. We've been made to feel like criminals, honestly. Um, I give advice to my young brothers who are very tall, six-foot boys, because I'm afraid that the three of them working together constitute a gang. I tell them to behave nicely. I tell them to dress nicely. I tell them to minimise their presence in public because I'm afraid that, unfortunately, things can get really bad, particularly when we've had, at least in Victoria, far-right groups coming out and saying that they will take things into their own hands. This has happened before. This kind of language has happened before. Just 10 minutes from here, a young boy called Lyubgoy was bashed to death 
by two guys who said that they were taking their country back. Two guys that used very racist language to murder Liam. They beat him up because they felt as if they had lost control of their own cities. One of them had actually shown somebody a paper saying that the country, that, um, that, that the, the, the Noble Park had been turned into the Bronx. Okay. We have to be careful about the language we use because there are serious consequences for people who look like me. There are serious consequences for a lot of people here. And there are serious consequences for the victim of crimes because at the end of the day, it served nothing but to make us afraid of each other, which is absolutely useless and not useful for anyone. Mm. <laughs> Bates, and I'll, I'll come to you. This is, as we know, tricky, and there are a series of truths sitting in this room tonight. It, it is true that if you've experienced that home invasion and that violence, it's unforgettable. It is true that people have been stereotyped and typecast. It is true that there are some young um, Sudanese boys and, and young men who are disenfranchised and who have engaged in violent behaviour. How do you experience it from your side? Uh, are, are there any categorizations or descriptions or understandings of this situation that can actually improve it? Well, I think that the main thing, you know, you, and you hit the nail on the head when you use the word stereotype, because that's what we should see as a red flag. You know, when we start to use language that takes, you know, in the, in the circumstances of these young South Sudanese offenders, just quite a, a, you know, a small number of people, and then we use that to vilify a whole community, that should be a real red flag to us. Um, and, and that happened way too often. And I was speaking to a young group of South Sudanese men um, in the last couple of weeks, and, and their experience and how this relates to them, they boarded a train in Williams Landing in the middle of the day, three of them. And when they walked onto that carriage, half the carriage got up and, and moved to another carriage they were, because they were frightened, because of that stereotyping. Um, so for me, that's the real red flag. When we, when we hear that language, we should be really questioning ourselves, and I think you make that point quite well. I, I just perhaps want to um, challenge our, our school captain here. Um, <laughs> we, are you school captain? Congratulations, I saw the badge there. <laughs> but, you know, when stereotypes are the same things when you talk about um, police, you know, we've, we're an organisation of 19,000 people, and yes, we've had incidents where we've had some... some people do some terrible things. But don't fall for the stereotype. There's lots of good work and lots of good people in our place, and you can trust us. Alan Tudge, let's um, go to you and, and go back to the question as well. <laughs> Patrick's question um, mentioned the moral duty that the government has to make migrant and minority communities feel welcome and integrated into our society. Do you feel that as the minister responsible, that is your moral duty? I couldn't agree more with that point. And I think that overall, Australia is the most successful multicultural community in the world, where we've integrated people from across the globe and, and have come together and made this their home and enriched us all in the process. So I think that's right. And I think from the Prime Minister down, every day we are talking about our successful multicultural nation built on integration. His substantial point, though, which he started off with, was, was criticising Peter Dutton's comment and, and, and making light of that. And, and um, the only thing I'd say in relation to that, and, and while agreeing with many of the comments on the, on the panel, um, is when you do look at the data, it does show that many people are fearful in Victoria. And indeed, there was statistics, which uh, there was a survey which was done, which was uh, by, by news poll, if I... Uh, recall correctly, which show that one in five people say they don't feel safe in their home alone. And that had grown from one in ten just five or ten years earlier, which is a remarkable figure. One in five don't feel safe alone in their home. Home invasions will do that. So, and ho home invasions will do that. Mm. And, and we've got to be, we do have to accept and admit that there has been a problem with crime in this state. That's the first uh, the first step towards solving it. Although N N Nadal's point stands as well, and we can we it's can not bring it here. So the but, crime figures have gone down. But, but there's different types of crime crime here as well. I mean, we are not used to the, the the carjacking. We're not used to the home invasion. We're not used to waking up with elderly women waking up with someone with a baseball bat in their bedroom. Those things scare people. But that goes to, that goes to the issue of reporting. The crime it, doesn't, and therefore it, it, knowledge and, and understanding of it, it doesn't actually rule. We can talk about stats. Stats are sure. terrible things because <laughs> they tell lies. But you know, the stats. And they tell damned there was, lies. There was yes. a time in the past, Virginia, when 
Um, this this sergeant's when told that crime figures had to go down this year, used to take a crime report and put it under the blotter, and they would go down. Yep. Now, I don't, I'm sure that doesn't happen now, <laughs> but it used to happen. I'm not sure so that, that even happened then, then <laughs> yeah, It sounds, it sounds oh, like an old journal. Very, very briefly, Alan, because I, I want to go to the next question. And, and, and Stuart's, point, Stuart's point is absolutely right. We should never stereotype any group because of a small number, but we also have to be realistic when there is an issue within a group. And within Melbourne, there has been an issue within crime within the South Sudanese community. And even the South Sudanese community leaders that I've engaged with will admit that and, and want to work with the government and the police to address it. That's why well, I they, would... they admit that partly because, partly because if, they, they, if, you, if you try and push back with the statistics, which is that actually in terms of Sudanese um, or people who were born in South Sudan, the reporting is not correct because the, the crime figures are the same. Last year and this year, within the 18 months, they're the same. It's 1%. There's no been increase. There's no crisis. But people, particularly I've experienced that, we feel the need to somehow concede some ground because we're put in a difficult position where to say, but it's not all of us, seem as if we're dismissing someone fear. Yeah, no, let's leave it there. It, it's spot on. Praise, was, Praise has a question for us which goes right to this, and I do want to hear it. Let's hear from Praise Morris. Hi. Um, could I make a comment? No, I'd like you to read your question. <laughs> um, my question's for Andrew. Um, why does the media claim Africans to be Australians when they represent Australia in a positive light, such as football players, but when they do something negative, they're me immediately presented as an African migrant or refugee, even if they were born here? I... <laughs> I don't want to disagree, but... Basically, I think the media is very careful about it and, in fact, leans over backwards, as do senior police, to be very um, diplomatic and not to use descriptors. Uh, sometimes it, it becomes ridiculous so that it's clear that an accurate description would be to say a six-foot-four guy of whatever colour or whatever it might be um, would be an accurate way to describe an offender. And, in fact, the media tends to, to duck and to dodge it and just, and just say an offender, a male. Um, I, I think the media's been fairly responsible most of the time. And let's say, just put it on the table here, we didn't have carjackings and home invasions nearly so much 20 years ago. But this is not just an African thing. This is all sorts of things. Today in Leangatha, as Stuart will know, there was a, some guy did a triple carjacking. Well, I, I don't think he's a... Sudanese. I just think he's a carjacker. But we have carjacking now that in 1995 we didn't have. I want to go back to Praise. Praise, is that uh, a satisfying answer? Um, well, I just wanted to know, because when we watch the news, it's always um, when an African does something good, they, um, the media represents them as, they tell their story of how they came to Australia and how Australia helped them. Mm. But then when they do something bad, it's just African migrant and it's just, it's, yeah. And, and no, one no one celebrates that story. Yeah, all? I think you're actually trying to get at something deeper here. And that is that migrants are held to a very high standard. We have, we are. Um, when, when, when someone of a migrant or African background commit a crime, there is a response that somehow they're biting the hand that feed them. We gave you an opportunity to be the, in this country. How dare you act like that? We are not considered sometimes or given the leniency that you see with, with, some, with some narrative that is adapted, that this is a person that might be struggling with alcohol or, or drug-related issues. It's made to be inherently our failure. I, I have experienced it quite a bit, this idea that somehow as a migrant you have to tow a very clear line. You have to constantly remember and be differential and be thankful for the opportunity to be in this country. And I think that can be a little bit difficult because it suggests that we are not comfortable enough. Because we, if we are comfortable enough and we think this is our country, we should take the space on the table and be able to, to converse confidently and say our opinion without being seen to be as if we're rejecting the fact that we, we, you know, we've been embracing this country. I think we're embracing it. We're embracing the freedom to speak loudly. We're embracing the freedom to succeed and to excel. Um, and so I, I think that's a very important point. Let's try and get some comments from the audience if we can. 
going to be tricky, but let's try and get a microphone over here to the centre of, of, the, um, of the auditorium if we can. And I think I saw another, another hand down here. I might try and come to you later. Let's try as quick, fast as we can to get that there. And we'll try and get a couple of comments, and then we'll move to our next question. And Stuart, I wanted to come to you on this um, subject as well, but let's hear from this comment first. Go ahead. I just wanted to say I couldn't endorse your comments and your comments praise enough. I'm the daughter of an English immigrant. If I went out and committed a horrible crime tomorrow, I would not be reported as the daughter of an English immigrant committing a crime. I'm Australian because the colour of my skin, and that's disgusting. And it is a problem in the media. I was in the media for a long time myself and recognised that um, the media, like police, needs to become more diverse, and that's part of the reporting problem. But I just completely wanted to endorse your point that um, one of my parents has been in Australia for a long time. One of them arrived on a boat from England in the 60s, and yet uh, that doesn't... Yep. put any sort of pressure on me, um, and that's, not, that's a very unfair comparison, and I just wanted to endorse your point. Okay, thanks for that. <laughs> and we'll try, we'll try if we can to get, the, um, to get a microphone just here. Uh, sir, sit down. We don't have a microphone to you, so we'll wait till we do. Stuart Bateson? Yeah, look, I think um, whenever we start to uh, talk about the things that divide us and, and the things that separate us, we really um, should be... Um, welcoming, welcoming people, um, creating a sense of inclusion, not exclusion. Uh, and for me, that's, that's the thing that we need to concentrate on. You know, start thinking about the common humanity that we have. And I, you know, I've meet, met with uh, hundreds of, of African people in the last six months and they share the same things. They, they love their families. They want to succeed. Uh, these are the things that unite us. Uh, and those are the things I think we should be concentrating on. All right, let's go to our next question now, and it comes from Kim Ando. Hi, my question is directed to um, Alan. In light of the uh, comments you made about places such as Dandenong being cultural bubbles uh, for migrants, um, so Alan, do you think that the geographical concentration of newly arrived migrants is linked more to the affordability of housing, accessibility to familiar food, religious structures, and known friends and family, rather than any unwillingness? To integrate or commit to Australian values? Uh, th thank you for the question. I didn't refer to Dandenong in that way that you described. Um, I, I did a speech a you couple did, of weeks did, ago. I, I've got to jump uh, you, you I, did refer I, to Dandenong as a place that had such a high concentration I, I, of it, people born exactly, overseas. Exactly, but I didn't use that particular term. And Dandenong does have a high, high proportion of people born overseas as well as about one, almost one in five who don't speak English very well. Um, what I was... Uh, I, I made a speech a couple of weeks ago referring to the great Australian multicultural success story which has been built on integration, not on assimilation where you have to give up your heritage, but nor separatism of where communities uh, sit side by side one another, but integration where we merge together, learn from one another, work together, share experiences. That's and I was saying that we've been incredibly <laughs> successful at that, but that uh, the Scanlon Foundation report, which looks at social cohesion, identified two or three emerging issues which I said we need to be cautious about, one of which was a higher concentration of the overseas born in particular areas. Another was an increase in the proportion of people who don't speak the English, English language. And thirdly, some of the stats were showing negative sentiments across the board. And I was pointing out that those things we should be addressing now in order to maintain the successful multicultural country that we've enjoyed. One of the more important things there, I do think, is English language. Um, and we need to ensure for the interests of the migrants as much as for social cohesion that there is that common language across the community, that common glue, which is uh, so uh, vital for social cohesion. And, and we are seeing a diminution in English language being spoken in some places. But let me take you back to the question. Um, Kim Ann was asking about whether the, the natural um, inclination of uh, recently uh, arrived Australians to, to cluster in the same place might have more to do with the fact that you can afford the houses there. You know the food there. You've got friend and family there. Uh, absolutely. It's familiar rather than and I've an unwillingness point. to integrate. Uh, and I've made that exact point, Virginia. That's always been the case. So, so, you're, so you're, not, to... you're not saying they're unwilling to integrate? No, no, no. no. I'm, not, I'm not saying that. I'm not saying that at all. I'm saying that, in fact, over the period since, well, since as long as you can remember, people have tended to cluster together from the, from the same background, I guess, because of family, friends, sure. familiarity and whatever. But um, the, the research was showing that there is a high concentration of the overseas born in particular pockets, and often that is overlaid with a high proportion 
of people who don't speak the English language. Now, that makes it difficult then to be able to integrate with the broader community, particularly if you can't speak English, because if you can't communicate well, obviously it's much more difficult to integrate into the broader community. Well, but th there's a reality to this, isn't there, to this learn English mantra, which is that uh, refugees, when they come here, they can either study English or, or get a job before their transfer payments run out. Now, if you're under pressure to, to get a job and to get out into business before that money runs out, what are you going to do? Spend your time learning English or get out there and get a job as fast as you can and your English language suffers? Well, well English, I mean, it shows that English is critical to, be a, to the success of being able to get no, but they're put in this, in this challenging position by government policy, by the fact that the money's going to run out. So uh, what are you going to do uh, quickly? Well, I mean, there is, there is up to 1,000 hours of English language uh, that you can get if you don't speak very good English at all. Now, that's the equivalent of a couple of hours every single business day uh, for two years to be able to get English language up to speed. Now, what it does show is if you've got better English, the chances of you getting a good job are multiplied by four. There's direct correlations there, and that's one of the reasons why it's in the interests of the individual sure. to learn English. And all of the studies show that, Virginia. But you're not, but you're not, also addressing, you're not addressing the, the, the But it's also critical for social policy. cohesion as well. So it's good for the migrants to learn English, so they've got a better chance of taking advantage of the opportunities which Australia has to offer, including employment. But it's also critical for social cohesion. I, I want to hear from Nyadol, but I also want to hear from Claire O'Neill. Well, there's been a lot of debate. No, no, can I hear from Claire O'Neill oh, first? Sorry, no, no, no problem. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Look, politicians um, love to talk about how much they appreciate Australian multiculturalism, and um, the Prime Minister's fond of saying this, but it's not his constituents in Point Piper that have made multiculturalism in this country work. It's the people in the audience and the people who live in the suburbs around Dandenong. And the way that they've made it work is by getting up every day and being kind and decent to the people who live around them, who just happen to come from every far-flung corner of the globe. And that is what makes this place special. It's not a cultural bubble, it is multiculturalism at work, and that's what we see in the audience in front of us. You know, 70% of the people who live in this community speak a language other than English. I see that as something to celebrate. This is fantastic, and it's a but huge do, do, asset do, for do us. Do you worry about the proportion of people, uh, the increasing in proportion of people who don't speak English? Is that a concern to you? It's not a concern to me at all, actually. And when the government has started this mantra about, you know, we've got to set a university-level English test and we've got that's to make not, that's new, not true, we've Claire. got to make new citizens. Well, it is actually, that, Alan. You had true, that in Claire. the that po you true. had that law in the parliament we've had until this discussion recently. Before. And um, I just find that sort of thing really offensive because it's effectively devaluing the contribution that thousands of people that I represent and indeed you represent have made to this country without much English. There are lots of people in this audience right now who themselves came here without much English or they might have had a parent who came without much English and they're making a very fine contribution to this country. And, but, and I don't deny that, Claire. I do not deny that for one second. But, and we're but not many of those for, people no, would no, not have been able not, to come to Australia if not you had your university level test English. in place. And even some of the core migrant groups are supporting the English language being taught. And Bill Shorten himself, and you're contradicting, you're contradicting your leader's policy as well, because Bill Shorten has come out, at least he did when we announced the policy, and said, of course English language is important. So many of the we migrant need, communities say it's important. We need people to be important. able to function here, it's, of course, it's, it's but requiring people to speak university We're not English. saying right. that. Let, let, me, let, let me jump English, in. I want to hear from Claire. Stuart Bateson on this. I mean, the, the English language, we'll, we'll, we'll stay with that, although the issue of, that we're, you know, Kim, we're still staying with your point about, you know, the nature of, of, of where you might go to live at actually being a more practical thing rather than a refusal to integrate. But does this, the, the proficiency of English matter to you from a policing and social cohesion point of view? Oh, look, from our, our point of view, there's always um, interpreters available for us to get our point across. And, you know, I think it's worthy to note that I, I speak one language. Um, and I, if I look around the room here, there were people that would speak two, three, four, five languages. And, and I have great admiration for that. Um, it's difficult to learn a language. And, and when I think through this issue, if I, if I was to uh, move to... Um, to Juba or somewhere else in the world, I would look for a friendly face. I would look for uh, a place where I saw other Australians and commonalities. So it's not surprising um, that that happens here to me. OK, let's go to you, Nadal. Well, I think um, uh, the minister said that, um, uh, that a lot of migrants agree with the fact that um, English, the, the, the English, being able to speak English is important. But I think what is the difference is the kind of level of requirements that is needed in this instant. Um, one of the biggest issues, I think, particularly um, with the English language forming part of the citizenship test, 
um, is the fact that, um, I don't, first of all, I don't think it's necessary. I think it's already building into the, the systems that we already have. But I think that one of the things that it doesn't consider is that it can actually easily become a tool of exclusion. Um, because there's a number of, uh, of people who come to this country without a fall of their own, who have never been to school and who will never be able to pass an academic test. And I think to be able to exclude, and that those are actually going to be predominantly migrant women, who, by the way, don't commit a lot of crimes. <laughs> um, you know, and, and to put this group of women, you know, to be able to live in, in Australia, raise children, people like my mother, for example, um, who work very hard, to be able to not have the protection and the access to citizenship because they can't pass a, an academic test, I think it's cruel. And I don't think that's inclusion. And I don't think that's um, um, uh, integration. I actually think that's just marginalisation. Mm. All right, we have time now. The time has uh, flown this evening, so we just have time for one last question, and it comes from Sydney Montero. Uh, as an immigrant whose name is Sydney and comes from Melbourne, <laughs> uh, who loves cricket, AFL, sport in general, doesn't mind having a couple of beers and loves his meat, uh, I've had no troubles integrating with the wider Australian society. Uh, what tips does the panel have for uh, other migrants in you know, adjusting and being part and feeling a part of the wider Australian community. It's a nice question. Thank you for that, Sydney. Um, uh, I think we'll start with you, Stuart. Oh, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, you've look, seen it firsthand. What, what, what would the key you know, thing be? I'd rather perhaps put the, the challenge out to the broader the community. And, and I think, you know, um, we do have a threat to our multicultural reputation at the moment. And it'll take leadership uh, across a wide variety of, of government levels and organisations, but also the community. You know, we, we, we often um, look back to days when we knew our neighbours. Well, why can't we do that now? Um, reach out. Um, understand your neighbours, um, make them feel welcome, uh, and you'll be richly re rewarded with great stories and, and maybe a, a person to play backyard cricket with. <laughs> in your Claire and Neil. in the bin, so. <laughs> <laughs> What a great question. Um, well, my experience in this community is usually around food. That seems to be the thing that brings people together really effectively, and uh, so that's my hot tip. Alan Tudge. I think we are a fantastic multicultural community generally, and that um, one way that you can get to know your neighbours or get to know the community is to join a sporting club. It's a fantastic way to, to integrate with other people or join the local rotary or church group or whatever. Okay. I, I completely agree with you. Um, <laughs> That's nice to say. <laughs> <laughs> but I absolutely agree with you. And, and I think this is truly a wonderful country. You know, I don't think, um, you know, personally for me, my life would be what it is today, to have come from a refugee camp and to have ended up getting an education and to live in this safety. I think this is a wonderful country. And if I can say anything to you know, people out there, is have a go. And, uh, and you'll be surprised how many people are willing to help you and volunteer their time. Andrew Rule. I just want to <clears throat> endorse the idea of that sport, I'm not a sportsman myself particularly, but I think sport is the glue that puts uh, communities together because everyone loves the new kid that's good at the game, mm -hmm. uh, regardless of where they come from. I've always wanted to host a footy show. I feel like it's <laughs> feels kind of good. That's all we have time for tonight. Please thank our marvellous panel, won't you? Stuart Bateson, Claire O'Neill, Alan Tudge, Nadal Noon, and Andrew Wood. Thank you, everyone. And you can continue the discussion with Q&A Extra on News Radio and Facebook Live, where Tracy Holmes is joined by James Aravanatakis, Professor of Sociology at Western Sydney University. Next Monday on Q&A, Tony Jones will be back, and he'll be joined by the Minister for Communications and the Arts, Mitch Fifield, Labor frontbencher Amanda Rishworth, the International Director of Human Rights Watch, Ken Roth, and singer and songwriter Missy Higgins. I'll be back on breakfast this Wednesday. I get tomorrow morning off. <laughs> you can join me there or next time I'm here on Q&A. Good night. <laughs>